Today, we're gonna to dive into payments and how crypto may be merging into a new evolution of where the growth of the market might go. And many of you have asked about, well, who are some of the players that are making these moves? And we've talked about a handful of those. One, of course, has been AMP and Flexa. We thought, hey, let's get Tyler Spaulding back on the show. It's gonna be fun today. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to TechPath. Joining me, of course, is Tyler Spaulding, CEO and co-founder over at Flexa. Great to have you back on the show, Tyler. Likewise, Paul. Thanks for having me. Excellent stuff, man. Last time we had a video, a very popular video. Uh, I think a lot of, of AMP uh, fan base, you know, that really watched kind of the moves of what Flexa is doing. So uh, first of all, for some of our new viewers and maybe people new to crypto, let's explain how AMP and Flexa are kind of commingled and how they work together. Sure. Um, and it kind of goes along. Uh, you had a great intro of sort of the future maybe of, of crypto sort of evolving into payments. Um, uh, I would uh, just caveat that. You said maybe. Uh, I would say with certainty. Uh, it is 100%. I like your attitude. I mean, it just really is, right? When you see yeah. all the little inefficiencies, how this is all put together, um, yeah. we really started Flexa as a payments company. This isn't something that was, oh, we love crypto. I mean, I've been in crypto for more than 11 years, right? So this is something yeah. I'm very passionate about. We love using it. I believe in the utility. I think this is going to have sort of an entire evolution on its own. But aside from that, this is very much a payments company that then uses these new technologies that we view as the means to solving a lot of the problems that we have today. And so that's why, you know, that inevitability, I'm just 100% um, a believer in what this will start to look like. And so yeah. how that uh, relates to Flexa, AMP, uh, AMP is just a new payments network, a digital network that connects to all hardware, software, points of sale, online. It's just um, sort of this web that allows for payments to go, or merchants to receive payments. And so the network is also open. So any wallet in the world can then connect to Flexa and then pay with those assets just at a normal point of sale. So think about just scanning your phone or scanning something at the point of sale, like scanning a QR code, uh, that's it. It's just very, very simple, straightforward process. You make the payment. And so that's what Flexa really is. And so where AMP comes into play, uh, that's a collateral mechanism to allow all the wallets to participate in the network itself. So that's really where the whole crypto network and real interesting components come into play to allow that utility of all these wallets to permissionlessly access the network. I was looking at your Medium post that kind of talked about, you know, the digital, to your point, digital payments from any app. And obviously you see all the big players there, Coinbase Wallet, Phantoms in there, Cash App. I mean, you've got pretty much all the stars of the payment industries right now that are connected in through Flexa, powered by Flexa through AMP. And one statement here that I think is one that a lot of people kind of forget, and that is right here, uh, 99 plus digital currencies across 12 different blockchain networks in real time. Big statement here right here is zero fraud. Now let's mm -hmm. talk about that for a second because that's probably one of the biggest misnomers I think of the payments industry today. Credit card processing today is very fraud laden. Uh, the amount of fraud that's going on within the credit card industry is absolutely insane and massive. And that's obviously one of the reasons that banks have really struggled with this. Um, mm -hmm. How does Flexa and AMP fix this? I mean, obviously crypto is a, a completely different model, but it is, is this through all the partnerships or is it just the blockchain in general that solves this issue? Yeah, it's really, um, there's a couple of pieces. One, it's how you can verify digital assets and they're, they're, if they're genuine and that the transaction has now occurred. And so you can do that in a very, very cost efficient way. Um, so it's very, when you look at a, a uh, issuing banks, for instance, they're the ones that are having to take on all the liability yeah. in understanding with very limited data, um, is this transaction good? And so when you actually now decentralize that piece in these sorts of assets that are getting used, um, how you can verify that with a very, very low cost, that's one part. So that's like kind of the decentralizing verification across these different types of technologies to verify that a payment has been sort of completed in a very cost effective way. That's part. And then the other part is the collateral mechanism. And so all of the payments are collateralized. And so yeah. there is a certain amount of risk with that. But again, now we're sort of decentralizing the risk 
among the users of the system. And so they'll understand, you know, what are some of these risks? Are payment apps maybe more risky than others? Some centralized ones are going to be really straightforward and probably have very, very low risk. Um, some that are brand new um, using um, smaller chains or different types of assets, maybe there will be a little more risk. Um, but in any event, Flexa insulates all of that to the merchant. And so every single merchant, every single purchase to a merchant is instant. So regardless of what asset it is, and then there's no fraud associated. It's 100% guarantee. They won't have any chargebacks and there won't be any reversible transactions, which we think is really game changing, especially for yeah. online payments, um, because we just don't have to deal there. There's always, as you define fraud too, um, you can't make the most blanket blanket statement and say absolutely no fraud of any kind. There's different types where account takeover, right? If someone sure, steals sure. your phone, it's always just going to be like stealing cash, right? So you yeah. can't eliminate all these pieces, but you can make it, I think, 99% better. I mean, literally, you can cut through almost all of the real inefficiencies and the issues where you can't um, steal someone's um, card number, right? You can't figure right. out what the card numbers are. You can't. Uh, all these exploitive systems currently really won't be in play in the new digital technologies, which is great. Yeah, I, you know, I've been in tech for many years, used to work with a lot of black hat guys that were in the process of developing, you know, break systems that we were designing cybersecurity scenarios that would basically address, you know, issues like this. So it was basically keying up you r randomized uh, queries that would be trying to guess credit card numbers to try to break these right. systems. And that's being uh, being done around the world. Now, though, we're using a lot more algorithms, AI, a lot of the hackers, as well as uh, security analysts, I think, are really seeing a lot more tools and being able to get into banks. And, and, and we're seeing more a lot more breaches, obviously, through credit card you know, storage systems when people's got millions of credit cards stored. That's a big issue. With all this being uh, done and maybe shifted, well, eventually being shifted over to the blockchain, here's my question is, where does the merchant fees shift from? Because this is, we're talking almost trillions of dollars being made in merchant fees and credit card services, bank services, that eventually would be shifted over to blockchain. How does that shift occur? And will those fees go lower? for merchants and uh, retail users? Or will we see just a shift of those fees moving on to the blockchain in the future in, for, in terms of transactions? Oh, man. That, that's one of the best questions I've ever gotten, honestly. Uh, so I really appreciate that one. Um, <laughs> so I'll even address it more generally first. Um, unless there's going to be a major shift in either the net cost or the participants or, or something more sort of at a macro level, it's almost not worth doing, right? If all you do is right. you shift the existing model to a new technology and it costs the same, or it's just a different group rent seeking in a different way, like you're not really moving the needle. And so there really isn't much, you know, especially in these duopoly systems, like it's really not even worth approaching unless there's going to be some sort of more fundamental shift. And so um, we are going after a fundamental shift. And so kind of talking with what, or um, kind of in the context where I was just speaking about, the fees now can be orders of magnitude lower because all those inefficiencies, let's say you start eliminating fraud, which can make up uh, you know 75% of the net cost in certain cases, right? If you eliminate that, if you eliminate the other 12 entities involved in potentially processing some of these payments or just being messaging layers and all being a vulnerability in the system, if you take all of that away, you actually start trimming this cost to like, really, really getting down to the cost of providing the service. So in a monopoly, right, you can start charging whatever you want above whatever the true rate, you know, whatever the cost is of providing that service. Yeah. Um, currently now using these new choice technologies, you can make that very, very small. And so we're already looking at something like a minimum of a 90% reduction is generally what we're seeing in terms of the net cost of servicing the same sort of product. Um, then there's two other pieces. Um, the second, uh, second part to that would be rather than Flexa, just capturing and rent seeking all of the, the proceeds again, like the existing system, we're using that now to purchase the collateral token and distributing that back. So it's really all of the users and the participants in the network, much like I mentioned how 
you know, some will have to take that, that collateralization risk. They're the ones that are earning all the fees. So it's really this cooperative network as opposed to a new corporate entity just extracting all of the proceeds again. It's really this new, that's what AMP is, is a cooperative network where they're the ones, the participants now are earning all of the fees in the system. And so it's even radical of how that's shifting over in terms of an ownership perspective, participation, uh, how this would scale, how there's actually new sorts of defensibility because in a blockchain or a, or a public um, decentralized database or a product, you everyone can clone your code. It's all open source, right? So you can't have the competitive advantages like before. And so you really need these like buy-ins, these cooperative networks of the users and the participants really benefiting from that system. And so that's really what we did um, with AMP and Flexo. We think that's a very novel and critical way of why we've seen so much adoption and how this actually has a chance of really kind of breaking into some of the, the monopoly systems we see. Um, and I'd add one slight, the second piece, another slight fun piece that um, is starting to evolve, which is we can even start rethinking this. Um, why should a merchant have to pay for the privilege of receiving your money? Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're selling you goods and services. Why do they have to pay for that? Like that model, I think, is actually fundamentally broken. So when you now start combining what we're seeing in DeFi, and now you're gonna have billions if not trillions of dollars all sitting in various vaults or in various states of transit. Right. Uh, all, it's, it gets super interesting. Uh, and I'd say that's something that I'm working on personally and even with my team very aggressively of what that starts to look like. And can you use something like DeFi to actually lower the rate even, uh, make it even smaller yep. or change it? Who says, who says a merchant couldn't be paid to receive payments? And then it becomes yeah, we, a whole different type of network, and that's really yeah. You're exciting. you're getting into definitely the arbitrage side of things. It's kind of like uh, if you think about how stocks are arbitrage. That that's where kind of the zero fees of Robinhood and things of that nature. They're they're making money mm -hmm. on the order. the The whole idea with uh, DeFi, to your point, is there's an opportunity here that there's money being could be being made that would even reduce or would give the opportunity to reduce these fees maybe into the negative. I could see that being mm -hmm. a case. With that, okay, so obviously with this kind of grand plan, every merchant I know out there would say, of course, this is a no-brainer for me. I, and most people, now it's just a matter of seeing some adoption occur. I was looking at your, um, your post here, and it's got, uh, all right, so Flex of Payments merchants can enable digital currency acceptance anywhere they currently receive payments, whether in-store or online, and mobile apps. You guys have a couple of things here within this. Um, and then there's a couple other things here I wanted to talk about, whether it's using a no-code payment link or a drop-in payment SDK. Is this something mm -hmm. that the merchant would be able to use as an SDK for their own website, kind of like an e-commerce e plugin? Is that how it will work? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, the existing plugins, we'll integrate with those. So it's really just like flipping a switch for them. Yeah. Um, and then on the point of sale, it's very much the same. So it's our job to integrate with all those providers. So all the payment service providers, whatever a merchant already has in their stores or online, we're going to integrate with that. There are other custom options, but we really want to make it as simple as flip this switch, you know, enable this configuration, and now this will now just work. Um, very straightforward. Uh, Flex will now enable all these payments. And from a merchant side, nothing else needs to change. Make it exactly the same for them. Super, super simple. It looks like a normal payment to them. And that's really part of the critical part of the process is that we don't really want to change any behavior on the merchant side or even consumers. We want payments to look the same. Uh, no one really cares how this stuff works at the end of the day, and I don't blame sure. them. So it's really just, can we just give you the same utility as anything else? Yeah. If we could do it at a rate that's you know 10% or less of what's already out there, that's kind of, as you mentioned, where that's where the, it's a no-brainer. And that's what we're really going towards. So explain to me on the POS side, because this is something that uh, I've followed for years is POS integration, uh, point of sales part partnerships. You guys have included integrations with Incom, Blackhawk, uh, Sitcon, GK, and a bunch more here. It, how, d with those guys, because those are kind of the traditionalist of the industry right now in terms mm -hmm. of payment processing. How do these guys take this for, because this kind of changes or flips the script a little bit on them 
on how their merchant fees are going to be collected. What is the process, I guess, for them to be able to get involved with Flex oh. and AMP? Yeah, so that's a great question too. We actually really don't change it for them, right? So um, just because there's, let's say, quote, middlemen, that's not necessarily bad. It's whenever you're there, like facilitating, facilitating a service that you're not either critical or you're charging those monopolistic fees. These providers are integrated in the hardware or providing the software. They're providing valuable services. And so we right. can pay them very similarly, if not identical to what they're already receiving now. So they're really a, a part of the network from the very beginning and they're very valuable partners. And we view it as they're not extracting value, they're providing value throughout the entire okay. step. And so, yeah, they are very much our strong partners um, and they will be there and they provide valuable services. So that's a really good part of what we're doing. So, uh, you know, I look at this and I always think, who loses on this end? The merchant wins, the consumer wins, the integrators uh, win. Is it just the banks? Uh, no, the, the issuing banks actually win too. Um, okay. So the, they're the ones, yeah, so they're the ones that are basically issuing uh, these other payment cards or, or the products. And so they're actually collecting the majority of the fees, but they're having to pay a percentage of their revenue um, to a messaging service, essentially. So gotcha. this card network, when, when you get your uh, credit card statement in the mail, it uh, doesn't say the, the messaging service card network. It says your bank, right? right? You're yep. the bank's customer. So that's good. They're, they're still happy. They want to remove the inefficiency. And so the reason why everyone is locked in is really just the acceptance. When you have these products, they work everywhere. This, this plastic card, you can swipe it almost in every country, anywhere you want to go. And that is such a dominant force that when you have that, they can now charge all these other fees and all of the other participants you know, might not necessarily like it. When you look at the largest bank in the world, um, just for comparison, uh, the largest card network in the world is worth about 80% of the market cap of the largest bank in the world. So people see this and they say, well, it's, what, how does that work? <laughs> how does, uh, you know, a, a basically software that's a messaging service that sits on top of everything else, that has all these other, you know, interested parties, how are they worth 80% of the largest bank in the world? So something doesn't really compute there. And so right. that's really what I'd say the lion's share, that's the piece that we're really going towards. Everyone else that provides the valuable services that's integral to facilitating consumer relationships, those other, that's great. And, and that's, you know, part of a capitalistic system that should really continue, you know, as a powerful engine. It's really the, some of the other pieces in the middle that might be, um, yeah, they've, they've become extremely dominant and then they've been able to uh, stay that way for a while. And we think now that there's not only technology, but then business model that will allow for a slight erosion of that. And we think there might yeah. be an opportunity for this to start at least fragmenting a little. And that's really what we're going for. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, you know legacy tech that we've seen started to move its way out. We're, we're going to continue to see legacy tech kind of get placed out of retail because obviously with mobile integrations into e online e-commerce, the messaging systems that you're talking about in terms of transfers for funds, how it connects all, the, interconnects all the banks, all those kind of things I could definitely see kind of just the layers. Obviously most of that's been just bolt on band-aids over the last three decades because of web two and web one engagement. Now we've got really kind of a, a clean slate with, with blockchain and web three. So I can see a lot of that moving in this direction. All right, so I want to thank our sponsor today. That's iTrust Capital. If you guys are looking at long-term investment, this is the way to go. And that is a crypto IRA. One thing is that I always look at is who is the most trusted ones out there. And when you think about trust, you always look at kind of the overall value. And what they've done here is over 5 billion in transactions. Uh, they did a raise at 125 million, which gave them a $1.3 billion value. And then over 150,000 accounts have been created on this program. So great platform, easy to get to. Make sure and use our link below and use uh, iTrust Capital. You're gonna get $100 in a funding reward when you sign up with our link. Make sure and check it out. Tyler, when you look at all of this and from your perspective, you know the big challenge is still going to be adoption. And obviously this is moving in the right direction from a merchant standpoint, maybe from all parties involved, but the consumer, the retail, you know, uh, purchaser is still kind of the end bottleneck. You know, they've got to be able mm -hmm. to jump into crypto payments. 
What are you, what are your anticipations or what are some of your research showing in terms of adoption and how it might be trending in the next year or two? Yeah, um, so great question. Um, one thing I'll mention as it relates to Flexa. So Flexa just being a digital payments network, uh, we love the literal crypto payments. Um, and we're, a, you know, we're backed by the crypto infrastructure. So we're very much like kind of this crypto company facilitating crypto payments. But for us, it's still all types of digital assets. So even as this evolves into banking apps and other sort of apps that you'll already have on your phone, whatever value you already have, whether it's fiat or anything else, like we're going to enable that. For this to be ubiquitous the way that our, our goal really is, it's all different types of apps, all different types of assets where right now we're, we're focused a little more on crypto. Um, so from a Flexa perspective, this really does encompass all sorts of mainstream use cases, regardless of what the asset is, whether it's mm -hmm. blockchain based or not. So we're going to facilitate all that stuff. Um, so that said, in the current adoption on the crypto side, uh, we are actually seeing some, some pretty nice movement there, particularly around stable coins. Um, you're seeing things like um, uh, Terra and UST obviously has grown tremendously, but then they've also done a sponsorship with the Washington Nationals baseball team where now you're able to start spending UST at the stadium. And like that's starting to really pick up. That was not a thing you'd think a year ago was going to happen. And so right. you're seeing a lot with USDC, for instance, and a lot of the moves that Circle has made and a lot of other partnerships and um, even approaching it from a relative, regulatory perspective and a lot of the moves that they've made and participating and really becoming this sort of digital dollar, which I think is advancing. When you look at, you know, in our world, we want everything to happen overnight. We want the adoption to be here. We want everything to now all kind of come together. But if you really take a step back and say, wow, this is 10x bigger than it was 18 months ago. Like the yeah. run rate of this is actually, you know, the growth is pretty impressive. And so I see uh, stable coins becoming more and more interesting. The layer two networks are really coming online now. So we're going to be able to make payments in a much more cost effective way. And then it's going to be up to, I mentioned some of those, the DeFi products. Like I think that's going to be a real interesting angle is how a consumer can spend some of these assets and maybe earn on top of it or spend directly from their bank account or they're spending yield bearing assets, right? And it's all abstracted away. It's very, very simple, right? They don't need to go through all this complexity. They don't need to be locking up funds and doing all these more complicated sort of maneuvers. It could just be easy. And I'm seeing a lot, I mean, the projects that are doing these sorts of things are accelerating dramatically, even something um, a little more niche, but again, getting large, something like Alchemix where um, if any of the users are familiar, you can basically take out loans with your crypto, similar to how Maker and DAI would work. But then they use DeFi primitives to be able to repay your loan automatically. So, yeah. I mean, it's like you try to explain some of this to people of like, imagine you have a credit card and you go buy things with your credit card and the bill gets paid off by itself. <laughs> and it's just like, well, what are you even talking like that? I tell this to people and they're like, what? Like, no. That's not how I am like, no, no, but it, it actually can work like this. And so that's, you know, a year old now. And so is that the one to win? Maybe, but we're surely, no. that's one of the other really powerful, the network effects in crypto, I think people really underestimate because everything is open source, you know, in the, in the public blockchains, all the products can be built upon and you're reusing all these Lego bricks again and again and again. And so you can accelerate the growth of these products, it's so much faster than people give it credit for. So I really see some of these assets evolving and I would not be surprised if a year from now, if we're 10 X again, where we are, I mean, that that's very meaningful. And I think people are yeah. going to start using this intentionally, but then more importantly, I think it's going to power a lot behind the scenes and people will not know or care that they're using crypto and that's where it starts to get very impactful. And I'm already, we're starting to see that now um, in some of the systems I described or even what Flexa is doing, where people can start even using some of these centralized pieces. You're harnessing the effects of crypto, but you don't really even need to know it. And frankly, you don't care. You're just gonna get right. the benefit, it works, right? There's no one in the world right now that uses a banking app and says, well, I wonder what database they're using. Or yeah. what is their yeah. website? You know, what is their website code based on? No one cares, right? It's yeah. does it work? Can it be easy? And does it have an end value? And that's what yeah, we're driving sure. towards. 
Yeah, you mentioned something there that I think uh, needs to be reiter reiterated because that is something that in terms of curve adoption around technology in the past, uh, most of Web2 was built off of proprietary mechanisms, software development code sets, all sorts of different, you know, even e-commerce platforms were being built independently, not interchangeable like it is with blockchain uh, as an open source ledger. That one thing is the one thing that I think people, every time I talk to people, the first time they understand, if they understand technology at all, is that the adoption curve for blockchain and how it's going to ramp up because of its openness is really its, its killer app. It's kind of the secret sauce that is going to make all of this stuff ramp up so quickly. And to your point, possibly even faster and faster as we start to see a lot more movement. Now, right now you've got uh, Flex enabled wallet app. It says uh, now includes 10 wallets uh, from leading developers. I mean, some of them we showed there, you know, Coinbase wallet, Phantom, et cetera. Um, how many wallets do you, end I mean, you, are you going to make this to where it's just any wallet out there that's made it through a certain set of, you know, probably rigorous testing would be able to plug right into a Flexa app and I'd be able to use on my Coinbase wallet, my USDC that's sitting inside there? Yeah, so there's actually kind of the two flavors. So one is the Flexa SDK that you can plug into a mobile app. That gives you all the functionality of even being able to present codes to a merchant. So it basically allows for more ubiquitous acceptance. Um, okay. But the product we just rolled out last week, which is probably, that's been months and months and months of development. We had sort of that payments link um, when you were looking through the blog post there. That now allows literally any wallet in the world um, currently to just make a payment on Flexa. Yeah. So no integration necessary at all. So all you have to do is basically scan a link and it will direct you to like a checkout page or there'll be some information. You can then make the payment to that uh, and it will work exactly the same. It will still have the same integration on the, the merchant um, sort of point of sale and all of it will still work uh, with no integration on the wallet side at all. And yeah. that was something we had really wanted to build for quite a long time. But doing that is very hard. Uh, again, eliminating the fraud, mitigating the risks, and building it in a way where all the complexities around uh, double spending and malicious actors, all these other things, there's, there's thousands of ways you can start to look at this. And it's so complicated. And we had really struggled with how we would build that product out. But it... Uh, Actually, we built um, sort of serendipitously, we built a network like that in El Salvador. So mm -hmm. we were the ones that got in working with the banks there and now enabling all these digital payments. Um, so the largest bank in El Salvador, you can you know, pay your friends, pay your bills, take out loans, do all these things uh, with Bitcoin. And we, we built all the underlying infrastructure to enable that for them. And, and we're very, very proud of that. And it was really hard. Uh, uh, doing that in, in using Lightning, for instance. And so the tools that are available, Lightning is a little more nascent um, than a lot of people sort of appreciate. And so doing that in a meaningful, scalable, safe way, because that's, that to us is something that's mission critical for us. We don't even want to lose $1 in the system. You read about DeFi exploits and, and hacks and, and everything else like so far, We've not even lost $1 throughout our entire system and we don't want to lose any. So that's really, really critical for us of being able to build this in a, in a meaningful and, and sort of secure and responsible way in finance. And so it was really hard to do. And we uncovered a lot of other sort of nuances and call it hacks or methods or, or, or kind of approaches we didn't really expect. And so in trying to do the really hard thing and enabling any open source Bitcoin wallet in the world, essentially, to pay into our network and do it without fraud. That was hard. Uh, and I credit our engineering team with, with so much respect for and doing it in 90 days on top of it, too. So yeah. all of that, we then got that live was sort of this revelation of like, wow, that we figured out how to do some of these really hard technical challenges or you know, technical approaches. And we then rolled that out to now other chains. And so we started with the one that was so hard that now we could open this up and build it into an entire platform. And that was really the impetus for doing this 
And now we can accept all these other payments across all these other chains and we could do it from any wallet just with a link. And, and that's the real exciting piece on the adoption for us because now we can really start to shift to uh, some of the merchants, a lot of the merchants we have sort of ready to start turning on because now we can say, look, you can accept payments from all of these wallets now and today. So let's start you know, moving forward on this. And so for us, it's really our next step even is partnering with the right organizations, um, the right events, the right merchants, the right uh, kind of promotional venues, let's say, to and the right partners that, that understand the utility of what we're doing and what payments can look like. Uh, it's not really crypto speculation, but like, how do we now advance the utility here and, and partner, get the right partners and start you know, talking about this and making, getting that adoption and having now users start to understand what all this looks like. So um, some of that will be uh, uh, upcoming at the consensus conference in Austin, which is really cool for us. So, you know, that's going to be a really big event. So bringing in other partners, be able to demonstrate some of this technology, working with mm -hmm. the team there. So there's just like, it's all really starting to come together of now having that payment utility opens us up to all sorts of really cool stuff that we can start to do to, to really advance awareness and more importantly, usage. Yeah, you guys have come a long way since the last time you and I have had a chance to talk and it was about eight or nine months ago. And um, one thing around your point in El Salvador with the kind of the transformer side of things for multi-chain payments that you guys have indicated, when you look at transformers in multi-chain and chain payment, you know, how far can this scale once you get past Lightning and we look at some other potential chains and other opportunities outside of Bitcoin, where is the end point to this? Or do you feel like we'll continue to see new blockchains come on to the Flexa payment network itself? Yeah, I think it's pretty open-ended. So if networks are used and valuable and people find them valuable for payments, like we'll incorporate them and it's going to become more and more permissionless. So the way that sort of transformers works. So if you're staking a wallet, right, all you're doing is you're staking the wallet to verify that the wallet will make the payment to the main chain, right? So if you're staking a Bitcoin wallet, you're just saying this Bitcoin wallet will submit a valid transaction to the Bitcoin main chain. And that's basically what you're staking. In a transformer, if you think about it now as a layer two, so like the Bitcoin Lightning Network, you would right. basically be staking a node essentially by saying that node will eventually write the correct state back to the Bitcoin main chain. So all you're really doing in Flexa is just collateralizing a valid transaction getting written back to the main chain. And so the flavors of that, whether it's an L2, um, or any other network or any other node or any other service for that matter, uh, we could work with existing payment networks. So other crypto payment networks, they could just be a node within what Flexa is doing. So we could start turning this stuff on very, very quickly. Um, so in terms of any network, any other asset, any wallet, uh, that's all very fair game, uh, can be added in very quickly and we will be more and more of an advanced as to will be permissionless. So anyone yeah. that wants to join, they can even just add a node of any sort of asset or validation scheme onto Flexa. I mean, man, it's, this is, so the scale piece is actually the most exciting part is because we built this in, in a new way, right? So it's not us maintaining all this. It's not us having to facilitate all these other transactions and run it all ourselves. We can open this up to, you know, much like a, a proof of stake validator, uh, validators, um, anyone can then join as long as they're then running the software or they're providing the valid transactions, they can get stakers. And that's really a good proxy for how Flexa works. So you're yeah, taking the sure. system that has worked really well and now just incorporating it into, you know, some other kind of standard payment system. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, my last question here for you is, you know, obviously you guys are, are tuning into the known wallets, the known chains that are out there, obviously, the known projects, whether it's uh, you know Tether or USDC or other stable coins, UST, I'm sure there's going to be all sorts of integrations there. Last question I have is, how would private privacy coins work within this, and would they be able to plug into this network? Because that's kind of been one of the knocks on privacy coins is there's been no outlet for that privacy coin to be spent. 
And mm -hmm. in many cases, as we all know, how Monero and others work, it, it is one of the limiting factors around privacy points. Would this be something that could work within the uh, Flexa system? A hundred percent. And it currently does. So even right now, you can make Zcash shielded transactions literally okay. on Flexa. So you wow. can use a wallet. And uh, even in looking at the partners um, that we even announced that will be integrating the SDK and a part of Flexa itself, uh, Nighthawk was one of those, um, which is one of the foremost Zcash wallets that supports yep. shield, shielded transactions. And that is very, um, I think, fundamental to what we're doing at Flexa. We want this to be better than the current system. And from a consumer perspective, you don't, we don't, uh, that's one of the limitations, right? So a lot of people think that layer one networks are these payment networks. And I just fundamentally disagree. It's not how payments work. When, when I make a payment to you using Bitcoin, now everyone can see my bank account balance. And that's just fundamentally not how payments work currently. So you're yeah. not going to change consumer behavior. You're not going to change all these paradigms. You need to just build it exactly the way we expect things to work, but with better features. And so we've done that now through a partially you know, centralized component to integrate with all these merchants and, and all of that kind of traditional finance, those pieces. Uh, but why can't you just pay with um, you know, private assets into that system? And that's what right. we also support. And so now not having your transactions broadcast or seen or even on the public side, all people will see is you sending assets into certain addresses. Um, they won't know what merchants they are. They won't know any of that other information other than almost like you're paying into an exchange or some sort of omnibus account or something like that. So, yeah. and again, that was very much by design. So we looked at it as saying, all right, what are like all these like critical components? We like table stakes, we have to build it this way. So first on the merchant side, what do they need? How does this work for them? Then looking now at the wallets and consumers, like what do they literally need? Other than that, it's just building. So that's why our roadmap, uh, people ask, uh, yeah, what's your roadmap? How is it? It's like, it's literally the same from day one. We know exactly what we need to build. We just need to now put all these pieces in place and then make it bigger. And that's yeah. all we're really doing. Um, it's, it's kind of boring, actually. Um, <laughs> we put our heads down. It really is. It's like very traditional. We have everything, all the scaffolding. It's all there. It works. Now it's just how do we make this literally up a billion times bigger? And, and that's like yeah, literally yeah. and partly how we're thinking about it. There aren't any crazy new things we need to invent. All the, on the crypto side, we'll use the best in practice tech and uh, the software that's out there. We'll continue all of our integrations to make this again 10 times what we already have. And then globally, right? Allowing your wallet to now be usable anywhere, regardless of what your currency is, regardless of what crypto you have, like that, that's what it's about. So it's really just exactly what we have, but much, much bigger. Um, and doing it, you know, as, as fast as we can, um, but yeah. also not too fast, right? We don't want to overstep <laughs> ourselves. We don't want to get into a lot of issues that that other projects have faced. And yeah. so again, that's why we're based in New York and we put a lot of time and effort into doing that in a very meaningful way. Um, so maintaining the compliance, but still building a better product for everyone. So it's sort of balancing that constantly. So it's sometimes a little slower than we'd like, um, but the progress is there and we're, we're surely really excited about, you know, as you mentioned, when we talked last, um, we're probably, you know, magnitude, order of magnitude bigger even from there. And so hopefully even in another 12 months, we'll be 10 times yeah, bigger. Right on. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, and I think you, you hit on a couple of things, the awareness factor for blockchain, because a, a lot of people have looked at blockchain as being kind of that one that one area that was difficult to leap forward from, and that is the openness of the wallet system and how it works within you know traditional blockchain measurements. And I think the the solution that you guys have provided with being able to do, I don't want to call them masked wallets, but at least uh, wallets that have some level of privacy to them, which for traditional payment systems is expected and how consumers will. So adoption, that's one of the things obviously that has to kind of creep forward and one, the message has to get out there that this is, in fact, the way that future payments will be done. Obviously, the integration into privacy coins, whether it's Monero or you know, others like Zcash and so on, those all in their own rights will have that kind of built-in privacy because I think that's, at the end of the day, is going to be very interesting. Um, do you think, Tyler, one last question here is, do you think with more CBDC discussions at 
the nation state levels. You know, even the United States, obviously a lot of G7 and G20 countries looking and leaning into potentially a GBDC. If it does occur in the next two or three years, how would that possibly impose itself through not only crypto, but in through what you guys are doing? Uh, yeah, so if it were to come about, it's actually extremely valuable to us, right? Because this is exactly what we've sort of been building a foundation for. So we would love to say, hey, any sort of technology, any new digital asset, that's literally what Flexa is. So we would very much welcome that uh, in terms of, you know, and we'd hope we could even play a role of like how that could get launched and working with the various partners by saying, look, we have this already in place to enable these sort of payments. And Flexa yeah. will need to be just as valuable or required for something like that to exist. And so that's really good. Um, I think uh, we'll have to see if that also manifests. So for me, it's what does like a digital dollar look like? Mm -hmm. um, I think you could have two chain, uh, two, um, um, ways of looking at it. So one would be something like USDC, right, is already fulfilling a little bit of what that is, right, or yeah. other types of stable coins that are US backed by, by dollars in a bank account, right? Like that could get interesting where maybe governments will say, hey, that works good enough. It keeps the system working. These are still now digital alternatives, like this is interesting. So I could see something like that evolving. Um, I can't really see governments creating uh, their own currency without involving the banks only because the banks are so critical right now in terms of maintaining the customer relationships, in terms of issuing uh, money into the money supply. They'd have to rewrite and reconfigure all that, which I think is way too big of an undertaking that a government, yeah. when they understand that, like why, what benefit do we get about misplaced, like displacing all this existing infrastructure? So my gut tells me they'll use what's already there. So if they issue some sort of a token or a currency, they'll still be using the banks to basically issue that into the money supply and still the banks will maintain the customer relationships rather than the government needing to maintain consumer accounts. I, I just don't see that happening. Maybe it does, right? I could be very wrong, um, but it doesn't seem like the angle they'd want to take. So then it becomes, well, what does that asset look like? And for me, I would, it probably won't manifest the way that I personally would love it to be, which is true digital cash. We, we don't yeah. have that. Uh, it's a it's a real marketing message in the U.S. People will say, "Oh, well, we're cashless here." It's like, no, you're not. You have it's a digital system that the the basically these these cards again. It's a closed currency that they've got. You're using their proprietary system. It's not it's not cash, right? It, it's the ordinary citizen that doesn't have a bank account or haven't gone yeah. into those systems. You know, Hey, All in it's the not ether. digital cash. Yeah. yeah. So if we truly did have digital cash, which did preserve privacy and literally was like a dollar bill, but was transactable in, in a private way, uh, that would be really compelling. And I wish we could get something like that. Uh, it, we probably won't. So then the question becomes, well, what's the next best thing? And right. I do see some of what we have now with um, some of these stable coins, especially... I mean, then I look at it as you start getting zero knowledge um, layers on top of a yep. lot of this stuff. And it's maybe that's all we need. And that'll just be perfect. And it'll allow yep. us to then have privacy preserving elements when we need them, when it's valuable. Consumers mm -hmm. can opt into it. Um, it can be by default, but hey, you don't need to force anyone to do anything. It's now these features are available. And, and I see that evolving, which could get really exciting. So For you sure. might just be able to use a lot of the current tech that's out there. I, you know, I hope you're right. I think, you know, I would kind of agree with you in a certain essence of that the development layers that governments would have to take and undertake to really try to transplant a, what is a 50-year-old system would be something that would move probably like an elephant through molasses. It just would not move. <laughs> yeah. And we need something that's going to be faster. So I anticipate we're going to see a lot of stablecoin, you know, integrations, maybe in the short term, which I think at some point would be a long-term fix. The question that I've always concerned myself is at when, at what point does a nation state have the ability to mint and or create? Because that's obviously a big factor that circumvents the whole idea of blockchain, you know, in terms of limited mm -hmm. supply. So 
Lots, lots to talk about there, Tyler. We could go on for <laughs> hours, I feel like, on this one. Hey, man, it was good seeing you again, and thank you again. I'm going to watch you guys very closely. We're all over AMP. Uh, full disclosure, we invest in, in AMP the token. So for you guys that watch the show out there, again, thanks for uh, stopping in. We appreciate it. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is where you're going to get all these great interviews in the full force. And also, it's the place where you can join in on Diamond Circle, which is our free member-based service where we drop a lot of our inside stuff here within PBN and a lot more. We've got a ton around the Crypto Power Index where we rank tokens. We do a lot of sentiment anal analytics and a ton of stuff to help you on your daily ventures out there into the crypto sphere. So make sure and uh, click the link below. You'll find it in a lot more there on uh, paulbarronnetwork.com. And of course, if you want to reach me, just catch me out on Twitter. It's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.